I'm Kendra from Redgate. And in this video, I am going to show how YAML pipelines can create really powerful and flexible automation to use with your pull requests. You can use it for other things too, but in this demo, we're focusing on pull requests. So I'm working in the SQL change automation plugin in SQL Server Management Studio. There's also a plugin for Visual Studio. And I am on the version control tab. I have already created and switched over to a feature branch. This one's named Feature PR Demo. And I've already uh, done a change in here. But let's say I want to do more. Uh, let's say I want to drop this table. I'm going to delete the customer, customer table from my database. And that's done in my dev database. I want to bring this into source control now. So I click on generate migrations and it compares my dev database to version control. It sees that, oh, you've dropped this table. Do you want to go ahead and drop this? And it shows me a diff. So I'm going to go ahead and generate a migration script and it will automatically author the T SQL to do that change for me. Now, once it has generated that, it also updates my what's called my offline schema model. This keeps track of what is the full state of the schema in your database. I can go to my migrations here. I can rename the migration if I want. So I'm gonna say, uh, let's call it dropping table, right? Ideally, we'd put the customer name in there. We could open that script and, and modify it or review it if we want to for speed. I've just gone over to that Verify tab. The Verify tab performs a local validation of my code because I could customize or add SQL to those scripts. This makes sure it does something like a local build and it makes sure all my SQL is valid. It makes sure that it's all deployable. And so now I'm going to go over to my version control and I'm going to now write a commit message. If I had a, you know, a work item I wanted to reference, I could put the work items number there. So I'll just put number one there and I'll go ahead and commit that. And now I'm gonna go ahead and push this up. I'm using Git in Azure DevOps. And I'm gonna go ahead and push this up to the central repo in Azure DevOps. Now in Azure DevOps, if I refresh here, it says, ah, oh, you just updated this branch. And over here at the right, it suggests, do you want to create a pull request? Working in a pull request workflow is pretty common. So it sort of guesses, hey, you're updating this branch. You probably want to, this looks like a feature branch. You probably want to merge this into a shared branch. Now on the main branch, I have a branch policy configured. You can tell because it has that little uh, symbol. And if you hover over it, it says branch has policies. If you're starting new and you're on the branch tab and you want to add one, these three dots on the right, you can click on branch policies on the, the dot, dot, dot. If you don't already have a policy configured and it'll take you to this screen in the project settings where you can configure your branch policies. What I've done for this is I have configured the build validation section of the branch policy and I've said I want to make sure you validate code by pre-merging and building pull request changes. I have a pipeline named Live Demo that is required. This is required to be successful for all pull requests and it's going to run it automatically whenever someone creates a pull request to merge code into this branch, right? So my branch policy is on the main branch. This is for uh, pull requests that merge to main. So I'll go ahead and click create a pull request here and start one up. And we'll just call this VIP PR, very important pull request. Now, because I put in that commit message, the number one, it automatically understands, hey, I have linked work item number one, which has a name that actually in this case isn't really related to what I'm doing, but in the real world, I'd have a real work item most likely for the work I'm doing. I'm gonna go ahead and create the pull request. And because I have that branch policy on it associated with the pipeline, it is now automatically starting up the live demo pipeline. 
And I say that, yeah, there's one required check running right now. Let's take a look at that pipeline while it's running. I just want to show you the definition of the pipeline. I have configured this as a YAML pipeline, dot YML. And here inside the pipeline, if you're not used to looking at these, I'll, I'll explain a couple things about them. First, we'll collapse this tasks bar. Make the text a little bigger. We are using a self-hosted agent for this pipeline. Just because my demo environment is set up that way, this is a hosted agent that happens to just be on the same machine where I'm showing you this. I have everything installed in a, a prototype environment. Your agent could be, of course, in the cloud if you want to have your agents in the cloud. But because I am deploying to a SQL server, what I'm gonna be doing in this is the pipeline, it first runs a build. Let's step through this. First runs a build and then it's gonna deploy that build to a SQL server. Well, my SQL server is on my laptop. So I have my hosted agent on my local environment so it can talk to that SQL server. So if the SQL server you're deploying to is in the cloud, your agent might be in the cloud. It needs to be able to talk to that SQL server. We're also using SQL clone here, and it does also need to, if you're using SQL clone, it needs to be able to talk to where you have the SQL clone service configured. So the first task here, the build, if you aren't used to working with these YAML pipelines, the, when you see the little settings thing here, you can click on that and it brings up a graphic display of your task on the right. And this can just be convenient for reading through it or if you want to edit it, notice I have this all, it highlighted everything here on the left. If I wanna change something over here, I can then click add and it'll replace what I have highlighted or you can edit the YAML directly, it's up to you. So here we can see that to build a SQL change automation project, it's gonna output a NuGet package. And here I can configure, how do you want that named? We are using a SQL server to build our code, so we can say, where is the SQL server? In my case, it's just local to my build agent, but in the real world, you might have your build agent talking to a SQL server to do a build to validate that code where the SQL server is not on the build agent. That's totally fine too. I have not specified a database name, so it'll generate an automatic name and use a temporary database for that. There's other items configured there. Next up, I am Moving on to another task where I pull the build artifact down to my uh, server where I'm running the build agent because I'm gonna use that to create a release artifact. I next do a little bit of PowerShell here, and this is totally optional. This is really just kind of a demo of things you can do with variables in Azure DevOps if you want. I am taking the Azure DevOps variable that has the full path of the source branch in it and I'm gonna use that to name the database I create to deploy my changes to, but that this particular variable has some characters in it, like a slash that I don't want those in the name. I, I wanna replace those with underscores. And this is just an example, you can use naming however you want, but what this enables me to do is in this next step here, where I'm calling Redgate SQL clone, I can say, I want to name the clone live demo underscore and then I want to use that path that has the, the information about what pull request is this from or what branch is this from, right? So I can use that variable in naming things. SQL clone allows you to create databases very quickly, even if they're large. I can have an image of my production database and I can even automate when that image is created, I can even automate removing or masking sensitive data from it so that it's safe to work with. And at this point where I'm creating the clone, I'm saying, hey, I just wanna use data virtualization to very quickly create a lightweight copy of that database. And I'm naming it just for my pull request. I then go to the next task where I create a database release artifact. And I'm saying, I wanna use that build NuGet package, which I pulled down to this location to prepare a release and in this case, I am storing that release in a local file. I'm using this export path here. In reality, in the real world, you'll generally use a highly available file share for this. 
You want these files to be available to whoever reviews the pull request because they can be really, really useful. They contain human readable reports with things like static code analysis in them and information that'll help them understand the change. The next step I do here is totally, totally optional. Let me actually get uh, this into that right bar here. See, it's a, just a PowerShell script here. This one, what I've done in this PowerShell script, if there are things you want to check that are custom to your change requirements, perhaps there are commands that you want to be warned about if they are in the code. Maybe it's if a particular table name shows up in there, but maybe it's just, oh, I want to, I want this to warn the reviewer whenever create is used or whenever it looks like dynamic SQL is being used. Or maybe there are things that you actually want it to error on. Maybe you don't want any of these types of commands to be run without special permission or without uh, someone actually having to bypass the normal rule. You can run a custom script. What this is doing is, when you create the release artifact, it creates a file named targeted deployment script.sql. And you can, it's available for review. This is the exact script that when you deploy to that instance is going to be deployed. So you can do something like this, like run a PowerShell script that inspects that script for whatever custom conditions you have and either warns or errors on them based on your preference, right? It's so just an example of doing a, a custom inspection of that script in addition to the static code analysis and the drift reports and the change reports we already provide. Then finally here, we deploy the release artifact to the database. Now, the way that I have this set up, you can choose this script here, this PowerShell script here. If we look at the settings on this PowerShell script, there's an error action preference you can set in the pipeline. This one is set to stop. And you can see this uh, in the YAML as well, if you know how to read this in the YAML. But whenever you have any doubt, you can, you can always check these settings if you're not sure where to look. This is going to stop when we hit an error. If you wish for it to continue or to silently continue, you can choose those settings, right? But ours uh, is set to stop. So in other words, if we hit an error here, it's not going to go ahead and do the deploy in this case. How you configure that is totally up to you. Now, back in our pull request, how did this go? Uh, my build failed. So let's click in here and take a look at this. If we're looking at this, it says, okay, four errors were found. <laughs> check, check this. If we look at this, we are dropping that table, customer, customer demo. And we have this currently saying, if you see the word drop, throw an error, right? So in the script to do this, the way that this was written, it's going to drop these foreign key constraints first, and then it is going to drop the table. So we saw four instances of the word drop. We have four errors there. Because of that, it didn't go ahead and deploy the release artifact because of the way I have this set up. It said, ah, we're not even going to go ahead and configure that change. Now, in some cases, you may want to do checks like this, but be able to rerun the job and do an override, right? So if I'm looking at, oh, let's go forward. I'm looking at my pull request here and I have my run failed. If I want to, let's say I do get permission, like, okay, in this case, it is fine for this to be dropped. The way I have this set up, I have a variable created in my pipeline. And this variable is named bypass check of targeted deployment script.sql. If I, I have my PowerShell script, that task that's actually running the check, what it does is it looks at this variable and it says, only do the check if bypass is false. If bypass is true, if we are going to bypass, just skip these checks altogether. Of course, you could have it still perform the checks, but not throw errors. It's totally up to you how you want to do that. But for this run, I'm going to say set the bypass to true. I'm going to go ahead and update that. And now I'm going to go ahead and run it. So I can click run down there at the right. And now it's going to go ahead and rerun the job, but with that bypass set to true. 
Let's go ahead and watch this while it does. So first we run that build. We have that YAML bit that's running the build against the SQL server that we've configured it to. And this validates our code, makes sure that it's deployable and outputs that NuGet package. After we do the build, okay, and here we can actually look at the, the steps that it followed there if we want to. It cleaned, it then created the build artifact, and then exported that build artifact. We do our, make sure that we have our build artifact on the agent locally. We work with those strings because I'm using that custom string. And then here it clones that database calling SQL clone. And I have this set to, if you're, we're rerunning this PR. So I have it set to, hey, if you find an existing clone, go ahead and recreate it, right? So we can see that it deleted the clone, created it, and then finished. It then created its release artifact. When we get to checking targeted deployment script, this time it says, oh, you set that variable. So we're actually just, we're bypassing the check this time because you did the override. And now we're going ahead and we're deploying the release artifact. So I have, if we look here, I my pull request number here, when, when I'm setting that variable naming things, I'm using the, um, Essentially, when in a pull request context, it'll it uses this pull request number to name it. So I'm pull request two five two. So if I go and I look at my databases, and again, I have these all just uh, on the same machine. You might be using different SQL servers. We can see I pre I have more than one pull request active. Here is the one for two five two that I'm doing right now. And if we want to look at the changes in here, we can see we that table is dropped in here. But we can do a deep review of the changes in our pull request using this database. Now, to help us in our review, that release artifact that we exported here, here's the, I, I did two runs of this. So I actually have two release artifacts exported. We're going to look at the higher number here, the most recent one. We can inspect all of the scripts if we want. Here is that targeted deployment script.sql if we want to look directly at it. But these reports make life easier too. We have a list of all the changes along with static code analysis of it, as well as a drift report. Have changes happened in the target database, which in this case is based on an image from production. Have changes happened in there that aren't in source control? If we look at our drift report, in fact, in this case, there is some drift that's happened in there. So that can be very, very useful to review. And then we can also, if I go back here, we can also look at our static code analysis and see any issues in there. We can see just from the header here, we actually don't have any uh, issues in our code analysis that go against best practice, but we can see, ah, here, here are things, this is, <laughs> we are removing this table in here. So it's not like that sneaks past you, but we are still, a, we've gotten to a point by overriding the stop. The stop makes sure, hey, you know the rule, we're not really supposed to run this command without making sure it's really right to do an, and overriding it, but it still, of course, shows up in here for the reviewer to see. I hope that this tour of this YAML pipeline has been helpful. I find these pipelines are really, really flexible, and I love this lightweight GUI that helps author them and goes along with them. Thanks for joining me. I'm Kendra from Redgate.